Buying a new bike is always a brilliant experience. And these days you can either go to a bike shop or you can shop online. Now going to a bike shop's great because you can get touchy feely with all the cool shiny stuff in the flesh. But unfortunately, not everyone has a good enough bike shop to sort of visit. And some people don't even have a bike shop they can get to at all. And that's where shopping online really comes in handy. You pick your favorite manufacturer, you go online, you make a few clicks of a mouse and bingo, a box like this turns up at your front door. Brilliant, it feels like Christmas, it's a great thing to do. But what happens if you're not that confident in putting a bike together? And how do you know you're even making it safe to ride? Well, fear not, because that's exactly what I'm gonna to do today with this bike right here in the box. We're gonna take it out, we're gonna assemble it, we're gonna show you how to make sure it's safe and it fits you correctly for riding and get it ready to hit the dirt. Our friends at Polygon sent us this brand new Siskiyou bike in order to make this video. Now, bear in mind that not all bike boxes are very good. This one is actually pretty sturdy. This is from Bikes Online. It's even got plastic handles built onto it, so it's perfect for reusing. But uh, if you've got a good one, take care of it. Put it in the loft or something, and you might want to reuse it another day. Okay, so get the box open and have a little look inside, shall we? Okay, so in most boxes you get a little, uh, this is going to have tools in it and probably the pedals and some other stuff, but we'll get to that in a bit. As you can see here, there's a little bit of cardboard just protecting the top of the bike. And then you should get access here to the bike itself. Now it's got to make sure it's not hooked up on anything and then we're just going to slide it straight up and out of the box and then we're going to check it out. Note the lack of packaging on this bike. This is a good thing. Okay, so it's got enough packaging to really protect the bike. You've got a cardboard sheath on the fork, recyclable. You have a polystyrene protector over the disc there. That's designed like a helmet so it can crumple and no, nothing will bend. If you just have cardboard on that and it gets an impact, you'll still bend the rotor. It's got a little bit of plastic here and the rest of it is all Velcro straps or hook and loop straps with little rubber pads which can be reused for exactly the same purpose, i.e. traveling with your bike, or for a number of other things. It's really nice to see less packaging. It's got to be a good thing. Right, so I'm just gonna get the bike in the work stand. To do that, I need to get the seat post into the bike. Now, just note on this one, it has a dropper post. Your bike might not have one, in which case, this bit is really easy. You just need a little bit of grease around the seat post, slide it in, and just tighten the Allen key, put it in your work stand. If you've got a dropper post like this one, then note, the cable will already be in the bike, just like this one here, and it's just got a nipple on the end. Nipple just has to seat in here and the seat post, and then the housing slots into this little groove at the bottom here. Okay, same thing applies, a little bit of grease around the bottom of the seat post, get it in there, straight into the work stand. Okay, a little bit of information on the bike itself. It's a Polygon Siskiyou, and in case you're not aware, Polygon are actually one of the biggest bike manufacturers around. Uh, they're in Indonesia, and they manufacture bikes for so many other mountain bike brands. Uh, chances are, there's a lot of you watching this now, actually, that are riding bikes made in that factory without even realizing it. Now, one of the cool things about owning a factory and making bikes for so many brands is you can make bikes under your own name for a substantially cheaper rate. Uh, it gives you a really good bike at a much cheaper basis. Um, so this one is the Siskiyou T. It's also available in a D model and an N model. Uh, that stands for down country or enduro, so more travel and less travel at other ends of the spectrum, but this is the trail version of that. Uh, it's very progressive as far as geometry goes and astonishing value. So this particular one retails for about 2,300 euros. Uh, Fox suspension front and rear, Shimano 1x12, TRP brakes, 170 mil dropper post, and a really nice paint job too. A single pivot, linkage driven back end, amazing. Okay, so starting off, we're gonna leave the bike in the work stand. It's a third pair of hands. After all, it makes things very easy. Now, this is where we're gonna just do the bare bones of the assembly. That means getting the handlebars and stem sorted out. It means getting the front wheel on. It means getting the pedals on. Then the bike's gonna come out the work stand and go on the floor. And that is where we're gonna make all those crucial adjustments to make sure the bike is set up nicely. Now, to help you do this, you'll find that in the box of your bike, there'll be another little box like this one. And on the inside, you'll find a manual, some sort of Allen keys and tools, usually a shock pump if your bike's got full suspension, uh, and some other bits and pieces that can come in very handy for this. Uh, you might be lucky enough to have a little mini torque wrench in there. Uh, they're very useful, but I'm actually gonna use my own personal one today because they're a bit easier to show you exactly how it works. Now, first up, let's get the handlebars on the bike. Now, the stem clamp bolts on the front could be a four millimeter or a five millimeter on your particular bike. 
And if you have any, you want to use an assembly compound here. Now, assembly compound is essentially a grease and it has some floating particles in it that basically give it a bit of traction. It means you're not going to have to sort of uh, over tighten the stem bolts to stop anything moving. And it also means that there's no chance of any creaks down the line. And given the amount of leverage that go through, um, go through a stem from the handlebars, I think the handlebars quite wide in a mountain bike, that is somewhere the creaks can develop. So you want to uh, nip that one in the bud to start with. Now note I'm using my torque wrench here, and as I turn it around, you'll see it click when it gets to the correct setting. Now please note that although I've tightened it up here to the correct torque setting, I might undo it again to get the handlebar roll in the right place. We're just starting with what looks about right, and I'll show you how you can find the optimum setting when we get the bike out of the work stand. Next up is time to get the wheel in. Now your bike will either have an axle like this one, in which case you use a six millimeter Allen key to tighten that wheel, or it may well have something like this, which is a QR15 axle from a Fox fork. Now there's various different systems on the market and if you're unsure how to use your particular one and you don't really want to go through all the manual, then we've got a video to show you exactly how to do that, to show you to identify which one it is that you have and how to put it in safely. That's going to be in the description underneath this video, so you're going to be able to follow that, but they're generally fairly simple. As you can see with this lever type one, you screw it in using the thread on the end there and using the lever to tighten it and then you close that lever but it's really important to make sure you get the lever in the correct orientation. Usually this is facing up and it will be a certain distance from the fork leg. If it's facing forwards, for example, that could be dangerous because you could accidentally open it by um, clipping a wall or some shrubbery as you're riding. And that would mean the lever is open and the whole thing is free to unwind. So make sure that you do this correctly, otherwise uh, could spell a bit of danger for you down the line. Okay, so we already have the handlebar in the stem, but now let's have a little look at your cockpit position on the bike. Now, bear in mind that a shakedown ride, which is what you're gonna do after you've assembled your bike, is the best opportunity to find your true position on the bike. What you do now is get the bike set up with a good base setting so you have somewhere to start from. And as you can probably see, underneath this stem, there's a load of spaces here. That means the stem's really high. But you can also adjust the height by putting some of these spaces on top of it, which is quite cool. So the effects are uh, the opposite of high and low. So when you have your stem really high, it's gonna feel very comfortable when you're sat on the bike because you're gonna be quite upright. It also means when you're riding down steep terrain, it's gonna feel quite confidence inspiring. However, it's not gonna feel good when you're climbing because there won't be enough weight on the front end, be too much weight on the back of the bike. And the complete opposite now, if you put the stem all the way down, it's gonna feel really aggressive when you're climbing, it's gonna have a lot of weight on the front wheel, so that's great for aggressive riding, but it's not gonna feel quite as confidence inspiring when you're pointing it downhill. So let's start with it in the middle position for the time being. Let's have a couple of spaces underneath it and a couple above it. At a later date, when you've basically confirmed your feelings on the bike and you know the way you like it, you might wanna trim down the steering tube that the stem clamps onto, but you don't wanna go doing that to start with. Just get to know your bike first. Okay, so now let's move on to the brake levers themselves. Now, before we do anything with these, this is a safety point I wanna bring up. Now, people run the brakes on different sides, depending typically on what country you're from. I'm from England, we drive on the left here, and we characteristically have our front brake on the right. In America, you drive on the right and have your front brake on the left. It does depend on where you are in the world, so do take note of this when your bike arrives. Now, if you're buying a bike from Bikes Online and you're in America, it should come with a brake set up the right way, for example. However, you should still take this upon yourself to double check. Now, this particular bike actually has the brakes the opposite way around to the way I like it. So I'm gonna swap the hoses over on here. Now, there's a couple of ways that you can do this depending on the options you have with the particular brakes on your bike. If you have SRAM brakes, they have a flip-flop design, meaning you can just swap the clamps over and move the entire levers over because they have a design that works either way up. These brakes work just like Shimano ones. These ones are made by Tektro or TRP products. Now, these are exactly the same as the Shimano ones in the fact that you have to replace the hoses because these brakes cannot be flipped upside down. You'll need an eight millimeter spanner to take the hoses out and flip them over between the two brakes. Now, in theory, you should really perform a brake bleed after doing this because there is a chance you can get some air into the system or lose some fluid in doing it. However, in this case, I'm not gonna do that because I have actually done this process hundreds of times over the years and I'm just gonna be very steady and swap them over. This is a brand new set of brakes. They've been bled at the factory. They're in perfect working order. 
And if I'm very careful, I can get this done. However, if you do need to bleed your brakes, if you do this procedure, there's a very specific video for that. And again, we've got a video for swapping hoses over. If you wanna see this in a little bit more detail, definitely check these out before you go ahead if you're feeling a bit unsure. Both of those are in the description underneath. Okay, now just a little safety point with your brake levers. Now, bearing in mind that the handlebars are essential to get in a correct and safe position and to make sure that they're tight, and they can't come loose. Now, needless to say, your brake levers should be nice and tight on the handlebars. You don't ever want these to move when you're actually using the brakes. So it's recommended to look at the torque settings for these. However, you might be tempted to over tighten them so they don't move. Avoid this if you can. In an ideal world, you want the brake lever to be able to move slightly in an impact, i.e. if you crash into a tree. If it can move, I, if it can move like that, it's gonna get out of harm's way when you hit a tree. It's not just gonna snap the lever. I mean, it's fairly likely in the event of a crash, it's one of the things you're gonna crash or bend just because of the nature of them. However, you can minimize this by allowing them to move slightly, but in short, they cannot move under normal operation. But definitely allowing them to move slightly is a good way of thinking about things. Now let's move on to the brake calipers. Uh, we're gonna look at the one on the rear wheel here just because it's a bit easier to see. Okay, so right down here and the brake caliper. Now this applies to the front and rear, but I'm just gonna use the rear one for ease of being able to see in it correctly. So essentially you've got two pads that clamp themselves around this disc rotor. Uh, important thing to add, don't touch disc rotors with your bare hands and do not get any oil or polish or anything like that anywhere near your disc rotors or the pads, otherwise it contaminates them and your brakes will never be the same again. Okay, so you might find when you spin the wheel around that your brake pads, you can hear them rubbing on the rotor with a slight tss, 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 tss noise. Now, if it's very slight, then chances are you don't need to do anything and after a couple of rides, that will disappear. But if you do need to make an adjustment here, you need to adjust these five millimeter bolts. There's one at the front and back of the caliper here. And then you're free to move the caliper within like a couple of millimeters movement. The best way to do this is by looking directly down and you can see basically daylight underneath. Avoid doing it over a dark floor, uh, have some sort of light underneath and you'll be able to actually be able to see daylight between the caliper and the pad. Now, a good fast way of getting a, a simple fix on this done is to loosen off those two bolts just enough so it can move around then clamp on your rear brake using the lever and then just move the disc rotor forward slightly, um, clamp it down hard and then basically do up these two bolts. When you loosen them off, you're fine most of the time that it shouldn't be rubbing. And if it is, it'll be very slightly, in which case you could just loosen the bolt at the relevant end where it's actually rubbing and make that adjustment. Now, don't forget to make sure that these bolts are tight. They're a safety feature, so it won't hurt to check them from time to time as well. Now, I do have thread lock on them, but given the fact that anything and everything rattles loose on mountain bikes over time, it's definitely worth checking for safety's sake. Okay, so your mountain bike will have been set up professionally in the factory where it's built uh, by proper mechanics. They will have run through the gears, they'll have adjusted the stops on them, the B tension. They'll have done pretty much everything. Bear in mind, this is just an assembly video. We're not building a bike from scratch here. However, it's a good idea, whilst doing the assembly process, just to run through the gears and make sure they're working correctly. Now, of course, there's a thing called indexing. It refers to the correlation of one click at the shifter and one gear change. That's what you're looking for. Now, a high gear, of course, is the small one to the bottom. A low gear are the big ones at the top here. So if you shift your bike into the high gear, so that is the smallest sprocket, and then just, Cycle the pedals around a couple of times just to get things moving and apply one click and a shifter. With any luck, that will give you one gear shifted at the bottom. Now, if it's not quite jumping up, then you might need to add a little bit of tension on the system. You do this by adding a bit of tension on the barrel adjuster at the shifter. Turn this counterclockwise and that basically adds a bit more tension and then you'll find the gear jumps up nicely. Now you wanna make sure it jumps up nice and smoothly between the first three or four gears and back down again the same. And then fingers crossed, everything should be absolutely fine. Now, if they do need more adjustment, there are a few things you need to know about adjusting gears. I'm gonna throw actually a video to a SRAM and also a Shimano gear derailleur adjustment video in the description underneath that go into all of the nuances of both systems. They're pretty simple things to adjust, uh, but it should be perfect from the factory. But like I said, just give it a quick try. And if you are still having problems, uh, go to the description underneath and we've got dedicated videos on how to master your gears. Next up, it's time to get the pedals on the bike. 
Now the, the rule you really need to remember with pedals is they always tighten towards the front of the bike and they loosen towards the rear. Now the threads on them are different. The right hand pedal as you're setting on the bike, so the rider's right, that tightens to the right. The left hand pedal tightens to the left. The reason for this is when you're pedaling, the pedals won't undo themselves against the thread there. Now make sure you put a small amount of grease, you only need a little blob on the threads of the pedals when you put them into the crank because of the fact you're going to tighten them up very tight and you don't want them to uh, get stuck essentially if you have to take them off your bike at some point. Now there's two ways to tighten a set of pedals and it does differ depending on the pedal that you have. You can either use an allen key and it'll be a six millimeter or an eight millimeter in the back side of the crank or if you've got a slightly older set of pedals, it will be using a pedal spanner on the front side of the crank. Now at this point, it's a good idea to set your tire pressure. Now look on the side wall of your tires, it will have a guideline there. But a good starting point for any mountain biker would be to put in around 30 PSI front and rear, and then you can work from there. Treat this as a base setting. Now that's something we're gonna to refer to in a while when we look at the suspension setup, because you're not gonna get it absolutely perfect first time. You work to a base setting, and then the idea is you go for a ride, and then you can make small adjustments to get it to feel absolutely perfect for you. Now I'm gonna put a video in the description underneath that tells you everything you need to know about setting up tubeless. It's a great watch, and it will get you around all the little things that you might be concerned about uh, if you wanna dedicate yourself to setting up tubeless. Okay, now let's get the bike out the stand and get it set up for your height and position. Okay, now it's time to get the bike comfortable to sit on. That means getting the saddle at the correct height and the correct angle. Now, to start with, you wanna make sure that your saddle is within the guidelines on the rails here. Now, all saddles have rails and they all have markings on them, uh, which means you shouldn't set the saddle too far forwards or backwards from those markings and it will line up with the clamp at the top here. Now, a good base point to start with is having your saddle fairly flat. Now, when you set this up, make sure your bike's on a flat surface. Now, a couple of things to note about this are if you're running the saddle nose high, this might feel comfortable in some situations and it's also beneficial to pinch between your knees when you're descending or doing tricks, for example, if you wanna do that sort of stuff. It can be very uncomfortable on your undercarriage, giving unnecessary pressure in the wrong bits. It will also make climbing incredibly hard because typically you tend to move forwards on a saddle when you're climbing. Now, tipping the nose down slightly can make climbing like this really, really good but when you're riding extended sections on the flat, you'll end up transferring a lot of body weight instead of on the saddle forward to your wrists. And that means if you're running a low setup at the front, it could be incredibly uncomfortable. Now bear in mind, there's a lot of variation between the little adjustments you can make on a saddle and the same adjustment equivalents you can make on your cockpit. So it's a good place to start with by having it in the center of the rails and running it as slightly flat. If anything, I'd recommend going very slightly nose down, just a little bit, because your bike's naturally gonna sag into its travel anyway. Now, when it comes to getting the saddle the correct height, there's a good basis for getting a good starting point for this as well. Now, you wanna start by putting on your favorite pair of shoes that you're likely to ride a bike in. Uh, the reason for that is that all shoes have slightly different thickness on the soles, and this ultimately affects the saddle height that you run at. Now, on mountain bikes, especially ones with dropper posts, you wanna get the maximum leverage out of your legs without straining any of your joints or any of your muscles. And the best way to do this is actually quite an old school way of doing it. So get on the bike, uh, cycle the pedals backwards a few times and you'll soon feel if the saddle's too high, which means your hips will be rocking slightly and your leg will be really locked out, or if it's too low, in which case you would just know about it. To get the saddle set up for the correct position, you're aiming to have a completely locked out leg when you have your heel on the pedal at the bottom of the stroke. That way, when you transfer the ball of your foot back over the axle, which is where you pedal, you'll have the optimum amount of bend in your knee. And what this allows for is the fact you're gonna get maximum extension when your saddle is high, but also when you drop the dropper post down out of the way, of course, you get all the room to maneuver on the bike. It's pretty simple to get a good basis, although many people do choose to run the saddle slightly lower in general. Now, if you're running a bike that's got a rigid seat post, i.e. it doesn't have a posh dropper post like this one, then yeah, you definitely wanna have your saddle slightly lower, maybe a centimeter, even as much as three if you're riding really rough terrain. It just gives you margin for error as you move around. Okay, now let's look at the position of the brake levers on the bars, because this does have a big effect in how you use them and how comfortable they are, both sat down in the saddle and then out of the saddle. You've got to bear in mind that riding bikes is very dynamic. You're moving around a lot, so the brakes have to be in a comfortable position to suit you. Now, when you're sat in the saddle, 
if we just turn the handlebars to the side here, you want to basically draw an imaginary line along your forearm and into the brake lever there. That is the best position that you should start with. Now this is a general rule of thumb to get your brakes in a good position where you're not over stressing your wrist in either direction. However, this isn't necessarily what might work for you, but it's definitely the right place to start. Now note if you have your brake levers all the way down, it'll feel fantastic when you're out the saddle sprinting because they'll be in a perfect position for you. But when you're leaning off the back of the bike, you'll really be reaching for those brakes and it can strain the wrists and your forearms. On long descents, you're really gonna know about that because it will become very uncomfortable. Now the complete opposite, if you have your brake levers very high, you get immense control when you're riding steep and rough terrain, especially when it's fast, like sort of downhill style terrain. However, if you're riding regular trail terrain, it can actually sort of stretch your wrist in a bit of an awkward position. So it's not necessarily the best place. So our recommendation really is to run them more or less in line with your arm when your saddle is at a full operating height. That's a great place to start. Now, as far as moving them inboard on the handlebars, you wanna get the most mechanical advantage out of your hands as possible. Now, most brakes on today's market, including these excellent TRPs, they have so much power that you don't really need more than one finger. Now, I pretty much always use one finger, but perhaps you might prefer two. Now, take it into account where you run the brake levers on the bars. If you're braking here on this part of the brake lever design, you don't have that much leverage. It's gonna be harder work for your hands to achieve the same power. If you're braking right on the end of the blade, you're gonna have the best leverage you can possibly get. So just factor that in when you're moving your brake levers on the bars to get the optimum position for both comfort and power. Okay, we're nearly there. Now it's just time to get the sag sorted out on your suspension, and then you're almost ready to go and hit the trails. Now, firstly, what exactly is sag? Well, it refers to the amount the suspension sags under your body weight when you sit on the bike. And why do you need sag? Well, if you didn't have sag, your suspension would be immensely hard. It needs to sag under your body weight, just like you imagine sitting on a motorcycle getting in a car, to allow the wheels to conform and track with the ground. Now, if they can't do that, then the suspension is not gonna be able to do its job properly. Now, really on most suspension systems, it's widely accepted that you have between 25 and 30% of the available travel as sag. So on a fork that has 100 millimeters of travel, you're looking between 25 and 30 millimeters of that travel as sag. Okay, so we're gonna start with the shock first. Now, what you wanna do is get on the bike. So lean up against a workbench, a wall in the garden perhaps, or get someone to help you here. Now you wanna sit on the bike, uh, make sure you're nice and settled on there, and then bounce up and down a few times and then sit back in the saddle and as calmly as you can without disturbing the bike, settle the O-ring. Here we go, this is the O-ring. Push this back against the shaft of the shock and then as carefully as you can, get off the bike without disrupting it. Now the amount that that O-ring has moved on the shock shaft, that is the amount of sag you currently have. Now take a measurement here and you're looking, as I say, about 30% of that available travel as sag. And you're gonna need to add or subtract air here to get this to the right point. Now shock and fork manufacturers are super handy these days because they give you charts that basically correlate with air pressure to body weight. So you can actually get a really accurate setup almost the first time sitting on the bike. But when you go for your shakedown ride, it's definitely a recommendation to take a shock pump with you because you might not like the way your bike feels with 20% if that's what you're up for. You might want it to feel a bit more comfortable, in which case you go a little bit softer and up the sag to 30% and vice versa. Never assume it's gonna be right the first time. Uh, the chances of fluking it are pretty slim. Now, when it comes to setting up the suspension fork, it's the same principle, although it's a little trickier if you're on your own. Now, remove the air cap on the top of the fork and insert the amount of air that you think you're gonna to need to start with. If you're unsure, have a look on the back of your fork and you'll see, probably like this one, it has a little chart. It'll say body weight, I don't know, 170 to 200 pounds, for example, and it might say 80 PSI. And that is your starting point. So inflate 80 PSI into there. Uh, be very careful when you're threading the shock pump onto both the shock or the fork here, because you don't want to damage the threads on there. You're better off damaging the pump than you are damaging the expensive components on a bike. So do take care there. Now inflate them, and then basically you need to get on the bike and do the same process, except instead of doing it seated, you want to be stood up on the bike, because so that's more reflective of weighting the front of the bike. So bounce up and down a few times, and then very carefully, if you can, reach down and settle the O-ring against the seals, normally on the left-hand leg, uh, left hand at the rider's left. 
Uh, if you're unable to do this on your own, this is where you need to get a friend to settle that for you. And then the same as the back of the bike, gently get off as much like as gentle as you can without disrupting it and then that will be the sag that you currently have adjust this until you've got equal sag front and rear it's important to get it equal because you get a nice balanced ride now when it comes to setting up the damping on your suspension it's a little bit different uh, there's also guidelines but you have typically two adjustments to make this compression and rebound Compression universally have blue dials and rebound have red dials. On a shock, they're normally both together. They could be a lever like this one, or they could be dials. On a fork, you have one at each end. Typically, you have compression on the top and you have rebound on the bottom of that same leg. Same thing applies, there will be manufactured guidelines as so well worth reading your manual or at least having a look, skip through to the chart in there. For the body weight or for the air pressure that you're running in that fork, it will give you a base guideline on how many clicks of rebound you should be running and the same for the rear shock. Perfect base settings to go with. Now really the last thing that you need to do on your bike is a bolt check. As I've explained throughout the video, these bikes are assembled by professional mechanics. They know what they're doing, but still things come loose on bikes and run an Allen key around the bike, make sure everything is safe. Uh, it's a good thing to do after every few rides as well, or perhaps before going for a ride, just to make sure you keep an eye on things. After all, you're riding mountain bikes in rough, rattly conditions, so it's gonna be no surprise in time that the odd bolt's gonna come loose and disappear on you. So it's up to you to check your bike for your own safety. Okay, so you've finished building the bike up and it's now time, finally, for your first ride on it. Uh, just a couple of little bits of advice just before you go bursting out the front door to hit the trails. Uh, first one is to take some tools with you. Take, at the very least, take a multi-tool, a pump, and the shock pump that you use to set up your suspension. That way, if you want to make some adjustments at the trail side, you've got the stuff with you. You can do it on the spot. The second bit of um, advice, really, I'd say, is something that I always do with a new bike uh, on any shakedown ride, is go and ride a familiar trail. Something that you really know how the bike performs, uh, something that you can compare your new bike to your previous bike. That way, if there's any sort of differences you need to make to the setup, it's gonna become a lot easier for you. Now, like I said, if your bike does come in a carpet box, it's definitely worth seeing if you can reuse that, or perhaps you know someone that can reuse that for uh, some sort of trip instead of just getting it recycled straight away. And uh, as always, make sure you recycle everything and do your bit. I'm actually gonna see what I can find to do with all this cool Velcro that came with this bike. So that's pretty much all it had on it, keeping it in the packaging. That's pretty smart stuff. If you wanna learn any more about all this stuff I referred to in the video, all the links are gonna be underneath there. So for the SRAM video, the Shimano video on setting up the gears, uh, the brake bleeding video and swapping the hoses over, all of that stuff is gonna be right down there underneath me. And there's gonna be a couple more videos for you to watch popping up any second. It could be on that side, it could be on that side. Never know these days. But uh, thanks for hanging around and watching us. And don't forget, if you wanna learn more about working on your bike, head over and see what we make over on GMBN Tech. See you later, guys.